another 11 metres underground. Uh, two simple drive mechanisms, big curved gears you can see underneath. There are four big uh, car sized gearboxes there with sort of microwave sized ovens, uh, that, sorry, microwave sized sort of motors, I should say, that uh, have about a 1 to 244,000 gearing ratio so we can accurately move the antenna in elevation. For rotation on the base, uh, sitting on top of the base, big steel runner runs the entire circumference of the base. It's about a metre wide, several centimetres thick, kept horizontal to hair width tolerances. Sitting on top of that, attached to the upper structure, are three eight tonne blocks of steel. We call those steel blocks pads. Through the pads, there are holes drilled, and we can pump oil at very high pressure down through the pads. So as it comes out underneath that steel block, it creates a pressure wave, which then lifts the entire dish and floats on a film of oil that's 0.17 of a millimetre thick, so about the thickness of a sheet of paper. Uh, for all intents and purposes, that creates a virtually frictionless bearing. So a good way to think about its um, rotation capability is it's like a hovercraft, but it's using oil pressure rather than air pressure to float the antenna. So between rotation and a very accurate movement and elevation, we can point anywhere we like with uh, incredible tolerances, about three milli arc seconds, so much smaller than the width of the human hair. So you're going to get a view into the dish now. So while the dish is 70 metres in diameter, across the curvature of the dish, that's so actually 109 metres. So you can place a whole full ball foot inside that dish, in fact, almost two side by side. To flatten it out, it's the same size as the inner area of the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Uh, you can't get a good sense of scale on this dish unless you, because there's nothing next to it to really compare it to, but here's a good way to think about it. In the centre of the dish, you can see that tall cone-like structure in the middle. And that's the antenna's transmitter receiver system. Just that cone structure is the height of a five-storey building. So you literally have a five-storey building sitting inside a stadium-sized dish, and all of that can be moved with this amazing hair with accuracy. This has been operating on site here for nearly 45 years. In fact, it will reach that milestone in the middle of next month, and uh, we'll continue to operate here for many decades to come. So we're setting up for Voyager 2. Voyager 2, along with Voyager 1, headed off on the big journey back in 1977. Going off uh, during the nineteen eighties and visiting Jupiter, and Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Finishing that with Neptune in nineteen eighty nine. Since then, both voyages have just kept going. Each of these spacecraft continue to race out in space every single day at a speed of just under seventeen kilometres per second. So they're covering about one point four million kilometres a day through space. So that speed up to what has now been forty years, just over forty years that the voyage has been out there. Voyager 2 is currently just over 17.5 billion kilometres from Earth. And Voyager 1 is our most distant spacecraft now at about 21.3 billion kilometres as of this morning. So about four and a quarter times further away than the orbit of Pluto. And we still talk to both Voyagers every day, still uplinking commands to them, receiving data back. So this afternoon we'll actually be receiving from Voyager 2. That signal has taken about 16 hours and 23 minutes to reach us here on Earth travelling at the speed of light from Voyager 2's distance. Voyager 1, being further away, is currently about 19 and 3 quarter hours each way for communication time. Of course, along with the Voyagers, there's another 40 missions out across the solar system that keep us busy every day. All the antennas on site are always tracking various spacecraft. Uh, missions studying uh, the sun at the moment uh, on one of our antennas. Uh, antenna further out is currently just finishing up on a mission in orbit around Mars. And uh, throughout the course of the day, we've got lots of other things coming up uh, with uh, a spacecraft called Wind, another solar study mission, Stereo A, also a solar study mission. Uh, Marco A, which is one of two little CubeSats that are going to be heading off to Mars in um, May with a mission called InSight. So we're doing some testing with those uh, CubeSats at the moment. A uh, mission called SOHO, which is a joint NASA-European mission studying the sun again. We've got a little bit of um, radio astronomy work we're doing on the Juno spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter. And then uh, last on the schedule here at the moment is the OSIRIS-REx mission, which is currently heading off to visit an asteroid called Bennu, where it will uh, orbit that asteroid, study it, land eventually, get samples, bring those samples back to the 